We were at a school where two students had been having an argument over social media. It had been going on for quite some time. They were saying all kinds of things to each other online and it was affecting their lives at school. Then one teacher found out about it and she printed off the entire thing and called the girls into her office. When they arrived, she gave them both their scripts and told them that they weren't allowed to leave the room until both of them had read every single one of the comments that they made online out loud to each other. Soon, one of the girls is in tears, very quickly after the other girl is also in tears. They were so upset about having to read all of these comments to each other out loud and in person, but that helped them realize the severity of what they had said and they were able to apologize to each other. For many of us, it's much easier to be critical of someone when that person isn't in front of us. But why is that? Turn to the person next to you and discuss, why is it so much easier to be cruel online than in person? Online bullying is easier for the same reason that gossiping is easier. You don't have to deal with the person's reactions in real time. It requires less ownership, but the consequences are often very similar. In this video series, we'll talk about bullying and gossip both online and offline. We'll also talk about how to develop a culture where the desire to do these things goes away. Along the way, we'll talk about why revenge isn't the answer and what it takes to truly forgive. But in this first section, we want to take a broader look at some of the reasons why bullying and gossiping happen. There's a scene in the show Riverdale where Archie, Veronica, Jughead, and Betty are planning a weekend retreat. They want it to just be the four of them, which makes for an awkward conversation when Cheryl walks up. Remember, the point of this luxury weekend is to relax and unplug. Luxury and weekend, two of my favorite words. So, where are we going and how extravagant a wardrobe should I pack? Sorry, Cheryl, it's kind of a romantic couples only weekend. I see. Of course, my mistake. Well, have fun with your romances. Obviously this hurts, and because Cheryl feels left out, she tries to sabotage their weekend by opening up on some gossip. <laughs> Welcome to what I humbly like to call Lodge Lodge. <laughs> Settled in and spooning yet? Who is this? It's Cheryl, you welfare baby. Is something wrong? Not yet. I just want to make sure you know that Archie and Betty kissed in front of my house right before Christmas and that it seemed pretty serious. Like, with tongue serious? That's all. Enjoy your couples only weekend. Kisses to all. Bye now. Proverbs 16.28 says, A perverse person stirs up conflict and a gossip separates close friends. This was Cheryl's explicit intention, not just to separate Jughead and Archie, but also to damage Jughead's relationship with Betty, who he's dating at this point. Some of us may not be as malicious in our intention, but the consequences of our gossip can be the same. In high school, two of my closest friends were named Aaron and Allison. And one weekend, Allison did something at a frat party. And I was trying to get Aaron to tell me what it was. And so I harassed him until he finally did. And he said, don't tell her that I told you that. But I immediately went to her and confronted her with the information. That ruined my friendship with Aaron. And it seriously damaged their friendship. Gossip rips apart friendships. Speaking against gossip, Amy Carmichael once said, the absent one must be safe among us. If bullying is abusing someone who is present, 
then gossiping is abusing someone who's absent. It involves sharing details about someone that are unflattering or that can be detrimental to their reputation, whether they're true or not. As a general rule, technology allows us to do what we were already doing faster and more efficiently. But when it comes to bullying and gossip, some would say that the ability to do it over social media actually creates a worse problem than traditional bullying ever did. Most traditional bullies didn't follow you home into your living room and continue to threaten you. But if bullying is happening online, and if 45% of teens now say that they are online on a near constant basis, as Pew Research reported, then to some people, it can feel inescapable. Of course, you're only present to online bullying if you log in. And to people like Ryan Higa, that changes everything. Coming from somebody who was bullied in real life, I don't think it's really bullying if you can escape it. When I was being bullied in school, there was no escape. I felt like I was being backed into a corner to the point where I wanted to kill myself because I thought I had no other option. I was forced to be there with them. I was forced to go to school. I was forced to go to classes with them. If I had the choice, I would have avoided them at all costs. If you're being cyberbullied, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter, whatever social media, you are not being backed into a corner. You have so many options. You have the option to unfriend your bullies. You have the option to block your bullies. You have the option to escape your bullies by deleting your entire account. You are not being forced to be there. Having social media is not something you need to live and there's no law saying that you have to be on it, unlike school. That's your own choice. I believe that if you're gonna choose to be on social media, you're gonna have to learn how to deal with it. If you can't handle it, then just don't be on it. There's no shame in that. His tone does sound kind of abrasive and we do think that online bullying is a big deal, but he has a point that there are ways to deal with it. And we'll talk more about that in section four. But for now, we want to focus on why is this something that we have to deal with in the first place? What motivates people to bully others? Let's answer the question with another question. Why is Drake so upset? I'm upset. 50,000 on my head is disrespect. So offended that I had to double check. I'ma always take the money over sex. That's why they need me out the way what you expect. Got a lot of blood and it's cold. They keep trying to get me for my soul. Whether there's actually a price on his head or not, in this chorus, he's upset because he feels like the price on his head is too low. The fact that someone would only pay $50,000 to have him assassinated makes him feel like he isn't a big enough deal. In short, what he wants is more significance in the eyes of other people. Carol Dweck writes in her book, Mindset, bullying is about judging. It's about establishing who is more worthy or important. People want to matter. They want others to see them as important, legitimate, and powerful. So if someone feels illegitimate, they might turn to bullying as a way to rebalance the scales. Why you gotta bother me, man? Because I'm not doing very well at school. I'm reading at a third grade level. I really don't wanna get left back. So when I see somebody reading for fun, it makes me feel that much more stupid. And then I get mad. In all seriousness, behind so much of the bullying and violence that we see are hurt people who are trying to find a way to deal with their pain. They're searching for healing, they're looking for significance, but they're doing it in a way that only spreads the pain out further. In sixth grade, I attended a new school. I had no friends, and most of the girls in my class had been friends since kindergarten. So I befriended a girl who was also new, and she just happened to be the school bully. And I started emulating a lot of the behaviors she had because I thought that's what I needed to do to be accepted. I realized really quickly that that was hurting a lot of the people who had been perfectly nice to me up to that point. Once bullying starts happening, there are a couple of ways that these behaviors can be normalized and reinforced. First of all, if it's happening online, it can be easy to lose sight of how hurtful our actions are. You know, I, I had always thought of bullies as people at school who pick on you. But when you do it online, you don't even realize that you're doing it. You can't see the other people and, and you can do or say anything and it, it doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't feel real. It feels less real because social media only gives us a particular slice of what full communication involves. Unless we're using an app like House Party or FaceTime, we aren't able to get real-time reactions to what we are saying. We aren't able to see facial expressions or body language or hear their tone of voice. Then, whether it's online or offline, the person doing the bullying may be convinced that what they're doing is okay when onlookers don't try to stop them. This might happen because of a psychological phenomenon known as the bystander effect, which basically says that the more people there are watching an event happen, the less likely likely any individual is to do something about it. Some psychologists blame this on a diffusion of responsibility, where onlookers are less likely to intervene if there are other witnesses who are perceived as likely to do so. But of course, if everyone is waiting for someone else to do something, oftentimes nobody will do anything. However, 
when even one person steps in, it can trigger the exact opposite of the bystander effect. What happens when you instruct one person, one person to be active and step up? The results are completely reversed. We go from having a bystander effect where people are less likely to help to having what could be called a helper effect where in the presence of more people, as long as one person, one person actively helps, people are more likely to jump to be in a position to aid further. Human beings are social creatures. We desire to be a part of a group. And because of this, sometimes we can lose ourselves in doing what the crowd is doing. This means that a street riot can lead to a riot mentality in individuals. A flash mob can make everyone want to dance. The bystander effect can lead to people not wanting to help. But the helper effect can trigger revolutions of kindness in your community. Edmund Burke once wrote, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. But in order for men and women to do something, we must grow in our ability and willingness to take responsibility for our words and our actions. And that's what this next section is all about.